Welcome to History 111, Lecture 6, A New Wave of Colonization. Events in England are going to kind of take on a life of their own, and the English government is going to become less interested in colonization for a little while. And that has to do with a lot of clashes between Parliament and the Stuart kings. And in particular, there's a petition of right in 1628, which asserts basic rights the Parliament was seeking, such as no taxation without Parliament's approval, no quartering of troops in private homes, no martial law in peacetime, right to trial by jury and due process of law, all of which are things that hopefully you will recognize as being kind of fundamental to American rights, and these are the kind of things that people in the colonies are going to remember, and that's going to come up again later. Now, out of this disagreement about those types of rights, it becomes the English Civil War. And Parliament is ultimately going to win the Civil War in 1645, and Charles is going to be captured by Parliament and put in jail, but he's going to escape in 1647 and be recaptured a year later, and in order to settle this once and for all, Parliament orders the execution of the king. And the leader of the parliamentary faction, a guy called Oliver Cromwell, becomes the dictator of, of England for a while, and they call themselves the Commonwealth. But after Cromwell's death in 1660, they go ahead and decide to restore the monarchy. Now, out of the experience of the Civil War and the chaos that existed within England and all the social upheaval, the people decide they want a king back, and they go ahead and put Charles II on the throne, that's Charles I's son, and he's going to go ahead and take an interest in colonization. First, he's going to go ahead and grant the New Netherlands colony that had recently been conquered from the Dutch to his brother James in 1664, and his brother James, who's a Duke of York, goes ahead and names it after himself and calls the colony New York, and he's going to give a piece of that colony to some investors, and they're going to call it New Jersey. The king is also going to grant Carolina to a different group of investors in 1663, and in the beginning there was only one Carolina. Now, the king is also going to go ahead and grant Pennsylvania to a man named William Penn in 1681. He's going to start giving colonies basically to his principal supporters and some key investors who are going to really invest in these things. Now this renewed effort is going to result in what's called the Middle Colonies of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. The charter given to the Duke of York granted him all the land between the Connecticut and Delaware rivers to form the colonies of New York and New Jersey. And Connecticut itself is going to receive a royal charter in 1662, and those are people who had left from Massachusetts, and ultimately their border is not going to be settled for about 20-odd years. Now, New Jersey is going to be given to a man named John Berkeley and George Carteret, and they're going to divide it into East and West Jersey for a while and reunite the colony later on. William Penn is a man who convinces the king to give him a colony, but importantly he belongs to a religious minority named Quakers, and they want to go ahead and establish a haven for themselves there. And what's going to happen in addition is in the colony of Pennsylvania, he's going to go ahead and establish religious toleration for all, so a lot of Germans are going to flock there to escape was persecutions going on there. And within the colony of Pennsylvania, there is an effort to try to treat Indians fairly, and Philadelphia soon becomes the largest city in all the colonies, and it becomes very, very successful as a kind of grain-growing colony. Eventually, they're also going to go ahead and purchase the three lower counties, which had originally in Delaware, to go ahead and get access to the sea, and they're going to really thrive as a colony. Now, Carolina was first colonized by Spanish in 1526, but after it's conquered, Charles II is going to give it to eight of his key supporters in 1663. And it's eventually going to result in a constitution written by John Locke that's going to try to establish a feudal system there. And for the Carolinas, rice is going to become a staple crop by 1690 into go of the 1740s, and those are going to be key cash crops. But however, they're going to need to go ahead and split this colony in two, because the two halves of the colony have some geographic barriers, and it's very difficult to administer, and that's why you end up with a North and South Carolina by 1729. Now, while Charles II had tried to establish new colonies, some of which were captured from other European rivals, and some of which were newly founded, and he tried to use those colonies as a way to reward his supporters, James II is going to go in a different direction when he takes control after his father's death. And what James is going to do is he's going to consolidate all the northern colonies in what he calls the Dominion of New England and put it under a single viceroy. Now in doing this, he creates a lot of grievances with the colonists that live there. In particular, the new colony required religious toleration, stripped local governments of all of its power, and forced landowners to pay taxes. In addition, the largely Puritan population of this did not care for James because he was openly Catholic. Now, within England, that's also an issue, and particularly because James's daughters, Mary and Anne, are both Protestants, there's a religious strife that's going on back home in England. 
and out of that comes the Glorious Revolution, where Parliament invites James's daughter Mary and her husband William of Orange to go ahead and take the throne, and this results in eventually the issue being settled on the battlefield when William defeats James at the Battle of the Boy in Northern Ireland, and William and Mary are going to go ahead and accept what's called the English Bill of Rights, and a host, which is going to enumerate a variety of fundamental English liberties, and new colonial charters are going to be granted to the various colonies in 1691, and some of those rights are going to be reflected there. In addition, the Plymouth Colony is going to be merged into Massachusetts Bay, and it's going to be a little bit of a reorganization as well. So what's the big idea here? Well, first and foremost, during this time period, there's a lot of instability in England, and key examples will be the Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. Now, new colonies are going to be founded during this time, some of which, again, were taken from other European powers, but they're going to largely go as rewards to supporters. Now, the Dominion of New England is going to be something that's going to be tried, and it's going to strip the colony of a lot of perceived liberties and cause a lot of resentment. But out of this instability comes new charters, and looking ahead, what the English are going to do is they're going to largely leave the colonies alone. And while there are laws about colonies, those laws are going to be weakly enforced, and for the most part, the colonies are simply going to govern themselves. See you in the next lecture.